And so I appreciated that lyric and a chance to be away and to, to experience some of that. I want to show you a little bit. I've got a few images that help show the beauty that I was able to t- in, come in touch with uh, while I was on my trip. Uh, so if you'll show, pull up those four pictures, John. Um, so this is, this is Elephant Rock State Park. This is about an hour south of my hometown in DeSoto, Missouri. Um, and in it, uh, it sits on kind of this mountain uh, of rock. And there are these giant boulders that are on top of this mountain that are literally the size of elephants. They're, they're enormous. And so it's, it's this marvel of God uh, and the creation of the world. And it's just a great place to go and hike. And so I had a chance uh, the Thursday, uh, a week ago Thursday, had a chance. I pulled my nieces and nephews out of school played a little hooky, uh, and we went down and did some hiking at Elephant Rock State Park. And so, and it was a beautiful day. Look at that sky. I mean, it was like 55, 60 degrees, clear blue skies. Uh, Yeah. And you can crawl down in those crevices uh, and hike down on the ground in between them and then climb up on top and jump around and do all sorts of craziness. So it was just cool. And then, uh, as with any trip, uh, Eating is important. My favorite pizza place is back in my hometown, Pogolino's Pizza. Um, but had a chance to go out with my brother-in-law. He, they own the restaurant back in Hillsboro near my hometown. Uh, and so he works crazy schedules, but he's free on Sunday night. And so I said, hey, I want to I go out with you on Sunday. I know he typically likes to go out on Sunday to kind of celebrate, uh, kind of having some time off. And so he said, we're going to take you to a hibachi grill near here. Uh, and so he took me up, and then he ordered this plate of sushi which is just amazing. Like these sushi were like the size of donuts. They were, it was, it was good. <laughs> it was pretty all right. Uh, and then this is, this is in Wichita. This, this was at a place called uh, uh, Dempsey's Biscuit Company. And I'm going to own one someday. Um, but their biscuits were bigger than donuts. And they're like the size of your hands. And this was their Nashville chicken biscuits and gravy. It was called the, the Benton. And it was amazing. It was one of those things that when you eat into it, like you're like the scene in When Harry Met Sally, and you're like, mmm, oh, this is, mmm. And I'm sitting there by myself, and people had to be like, what is up with this guy? Uh... It was amazing. So I'll be going back to Wichita, if nothing else, to have that meal again. And you're welcome to come with me because it's that good. Uh, and so October is also Pastor Appreciation Month, and I think it's weird that you guys got rid of me for most of October. Um, but maybe that's the best way to appreciate me, get rid of me. Um, I'm not going to read into that a whole lot, but that may be the case. But Emily Denny came in. She said she saw another church uh, billboard on the way in that said, uh, remember your pastor, he's a gift. Uh, And she said she thought that was funny. (laughs) And I thought it must, they must mean gift like your Aunt Myrtle makes you that hand-knit sweater where one sleeve's longer than the other and it fits maybe around the waist, but it chokes you in the throat and the colors don't really work. So, so maybe I'm a gift like that. And then, and then somebody brought me these cookies that say Patrick, that are from the Middle East. And I thought, well, they must be like my sermon. They just leave a bad taste in your mouth. So, so it's good to be home. Let's just say that. No, they gave it to me. They said, oh, we saw them. We had to get them for you. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to try them. And they have my name on them, like food with my name. That just goes well. So we're in this series of, of hearing God. And not, not prayer, we want to talk about hearing God, because it's important that we, when we think about prayer, when we talk about prayer, we, we realize and we understand uh, that it's, a, it's, it's so much about dialogue. It's about interaction. It's about hearing and receiving from God uh, as it is telling him and sharing uh, what's on our heart and on our mind and in our lives. Uh, Dallas Willard says, our failure to hear his voice when we want to, is due to the fact that we do not, in general, want to hear it. We don't want to hear from God. And so that we only want it when we think we need it. And I I think that's so true, uh, that that often uh, we want God accessible 
And outside of that, we really kind of just want him to go into the corner, kind of be quiet, and to leave us alone. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard said uh, that Christians are uh, a, a group of schemers um, because we, we talk about how we don't understand how to interpret the text. And the reason that we do that is because of, it's very simple and it's easy to understand, but we don't want to we don't want to follow it. We don't want to listen to it because we don't want to invite that change. Um, and, I, and so I'm saying that not to, not to make us feel guilty or shame, but to acknowledge that, that that's true, that, that our false self uh, that, that Ross talked about last Sunday uh, in the welcoming prayer, our false self wants those things that instantly gratify, that instantly make us happy, that instantly make us feel better. And God wants something so much more than what instantly makes us happy that he wants to cultivate in us uh, a beauty and an appreciation that is void of being reliant upon out external circumstances, that, that, we, that we find our full contentment in the relationship that we have with God, knowing that we are beloved by him and that he provides for us everything we need. Uh, and that takes, that takes time uh, and energy to, to develop that. Uh, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, we've, we've said that over, the, over this series, that it's a simple aspect, but it's not easy. So I want to walk through where we've been the last few weeks just to kind of show that, that these aspects build upon um, hearing God. And so four weeks ago, we started the series, and we talked about silence and solitude. In fact, Jennifer did. And I'd still encourage you to get on the website and listen to that message or re-listen to that message because she did a great job of, of articulating the importance of silence and solitude and hearing God. Uh, and I have these notes in the, in the, on the bulletin sheet. But silence and solitude help us to create margin in our life so that we can clear out the noise, all the clutter that's constantly yammering for our attention so that we can hear the, st- the small, still small voice that is God's. That scripture tells us, God communicates us uh, through those whispers as opposed to uh, the screaming gong. With that, we, we pair that with uh, centering prayer. And centering prayer helps us to create the space uh, where, where we put aside our thoughts and our worries and our schedules and our conflicts uh, and even the good things. Where we put all that aside so that we can be stilled, that we can create the interior silence uh, is what that's referred to, create interior silence so that we can momentarily invite God to dialogue with us. And so it's, and that's a process of recognizing these thoughts that come, uh, acknowledging them, and then setting them aside so that we can return our attention to God. From there, we go into the welcoming prayer. Again, Ross talked about this last week. And the welcoming prayer uh, is this posture that we take uh, where we say to God, uh, whatever crosses my path, whatever comes my way, be it good news, be it bad news, may it be, it, may it be it frustration, uh, may it be it joy, whatever it is, I'm going to welcome it so that I can recognize that God's presence and that his spirit is accompanying me through that. It, it, the welcoming prayer is the embodiment of Psalm 23, that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which comes right after being led to green pastures where there's stillness and calmness and calm waters and there's rest and refreshment and directly followed that by a valley of the shadow of death. And so it's, it's recognizing that presence that as we go through this life, there are moments where things are calm and things are good and it feels like things are just for our benefit and for our goodness and there are other times where the turmoil and the storms and the sickness and the frustration arise and we think, why, why me, God? And for those who walk in the spirit of walking with God, where we hear the voice of God, we step back and we realize that God is present in both places. Both are neither more a blessing or more of a curse than the other, but it's simply life. And that life has moments of goodness, Life has moments of badness, and neither of those are directed by God, but God's presence is there regardless. That his presence is not conditioned to how good or how bad we feel. 
And so when we cultivate that spirit through the welcoming prayer, through centering prayer, through silence and meditation, we come to this place where we recognize that God is good and that God walks with us. And he takes us through this journey so we can get to this place. And so today we'll talk about meditation. And this isn't the Buddhist concept of meditation. Buddhist concept of meditation is a sense of emptying yourself, removing yourself, losing yourself and, and uh, submitting to the spirit uh, of nature, the spirit of the world. Christian prayer is the sense of setting yourself aside so that the love of God may fill the world. And then the other side of meditation, and we'll talk about this next Sunday, is then contemplation. Where after we've meditated, now we take what we've meditated upon and we join that with the life circumstances. That those come back and together because our will, our, our consent... Our, our heart, who we are, God wants to partner with that. He's not trying to silence us in the relationship, but he's trying to bring our true self out, the imagio deo, the image of God that is placed in us. He wants that to be seen in the uniqueness of our gifts and our abilities and our stories. And so meditation creates the space for us to focus on the goodness of God so that later we can use contemplation to join our actions or our lives with the thought of the goodness of God. This, this plays out in a few ways in Scripture. Uh, and, the, and the text we're highlighting today is, is Mark 10. Uh, Jesus has been doing his ministry. Uh, he has, he's had uh, the transfiguration. Uh, he talks about uh, his death. Uh, he talks about divorce and marriage. He, he talks about blessing the children. And at the end of Mark 10, he comes to this place where he's, ke- he's going through town. And he reaches, uh, they reach Jericho. And if you remember, Jericho is the town uh, that was key for the people to, to pass through the promised land. They had to pass through Jericho to get to the land that God was promising the Israelites. And so they had to march around the city 13 times, seven days, 13 times they marched around the city. And the supernatural act uh, allowed the walls to crumble and for the Israelites to be able to take the city and to move on towards the promise. And so these towns, they matter in the story that we're talking about uh, because it's insinuating, look, there's there's a wall that's limiting people moving into the promise that God has for them. And so they reach Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples, they leave town, and a crowd is following them, and a blind beggar named Bartimaeus is sitting beside the road, and he calls out, Jesus, son of David, come to me. And they tell him, man, stuff it, dude. Put it aside. Like, Jesus doesn't have time for you. He's got bigger fish to fry. He's doing bigger things. He's not worried about your blind self. And Jesus stops and he says, no, 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 bring, bring him to me. And the disciples gather him and they bring Bartimaeus up to Jesus. And Jesus says, and I love this question because this is the question we should constantly be going back to in our spiritual formation. Jesus asks Bartimaeus, he says, what do you, what do you want from me? That's a basic question of our spiritual life. Jesus is asking of us, what is it that you want from me? What do you want from Jesus? What is it that you really want him to do in your life? Because there's all these things that we go to, we go to God and we offer him these, these Christmas lists, right? As, as a child, I went through the Sears catalog and circled all these toys. You know, if I circle 50 of them, maybe I'll get two, all right? I'm going to give everything, kind of like the lottery, and I hope that, did anybody win that here? But just, all right, we're just going to keep pressing on then. I guess you got to buy get to win the ticket. Um, but it becomes that, right? We're like, I'm just going to give God everything. And if he answers or listens to a couple of them, then, then okay. But I, I've, I've thrown it all at him, right? And, so, and, and Jesus says, now, I, I want you to really, I really want you to know what you're looking for, right? What if he brings him up and he says, what do you want from me? And he's like, ah. Oh, I wish my brother-in-law would get off my case and stop beating me up and making me feel like a jerk and blah, blah, blah. And and Jesus is like, all right, well, you should work on that. You should forgive him, kind of a thing. But Bartimaeus knows. He knows with clarity. Like, what is it that you want from me? And he says, "I, I want to be able to see. And that's our state, right? We, we want to be able to see 
you, God. We want to be able to see Christ. We want to be able to see your world through your eyes, through your heart, through your passion, through your sacrifice. We want to see our relationships around us. St. Patrick's breastplate prayer that is so key in the history of the church goes through all that. That, that the eyes of Christ may be working through the way that people see me. That they see me with the same grace that Christ sees me. And that I likewise, I see them with the eyes of Christ. And that Christ goes before me and he goes behind me and he goes above me and he goes below me and he goes to my left and he goes to my right. And so that everywhere I go and that everything I do in life, I recognize that Christ is there and that he's in that because he is. It's not that he's limited and he's not present, but it's the lack of our awareness of God. Just as Dallas Willard said, we only see God when we want to see God. And so when we walk faithfully with Christ, we see God in everything that we're doing. And that's the call. When Christ says, what is it that you want? Our response should always be that I see more of you. That I see you in the world. That that my sight is completely filled and unblinded by my own self and my own selfishness and my own desires. And in this, we see this in Psalm 119 is this beautiful prayer where it says, meditate, meditate, I meditate on your precepts and I fix my eyes on your ways. And it continues then through that after Psalm 119, uh, it keeps building through that on the way that the word of God continues to influence us, that I will meditate on your commandments, that I will reflect on your ways, that I will delight in your decrees. How many of us follow God and we feel like it's pulling a square wheel? This is a spiritual drudgery that which I'm walking with Christ. And Christ is offering to us with ease that we find delight in the decrees and that we do not forget your word. Be good to your servant that I may live and obey your word. Open your eyes to see in the wonderful truths and your instructions that I'm this foreigner in this land. So please, God, don't hide your commandments from me. For I am constantly overwhelmed with a desire for your, for your regulations. Man, we're overwhelmed. Like, we stop there. God, I'm constantly overwhelmed. And God says, no, I, I want you to be overwhelmed for your desire for me, for your hunger for me, for your, for your, that's where I want you to be overwhelmed. That you want this communication, this, this communion, this fellowship, that you, that you can't wait to sit at this table to be with me. That's, that's how I want you overwhelmed. That's what I want you anticipating and looking forward to and hoping for and looking for. And, and the world wants this. We may not be able to articulate it. That's, that's part of the problem I see in the world is we don't know how to say what we want. We don't, we don't know how to be, we're not self-aware enough, we're not in touch with, with the conflict that we're having, and so we get caught up in, in kind of the, the day-to-day stuff without missing this hunger and this desire for something more. And I'm not saying the day-to-day stuff should be belittled, but it's that we should take the day-to-day stuff to God. And that welcoming prayer, God, this is the garbage that I'm in right now. This is the mess that I'm in right now. And more than anything, I need your spirit and I need your presence in this. Not maybe that it gets better, but that I have a strength to endure, that I have a wisdom to discern, that I have the companionship of a church to make the journey with me. And that I see in myself that I've got a strength that's beyond what I even realized or knew or have known. And and I want to show you how the world wants this. I stumbled across this video this, this, uh, the past couple weeks as I was uh, kind of preparing this, this message and thinking about it and looking at it. And so I, I typed in um, uh, just meditation on the Word of God, and, and this video comes up. Now, this video is, is of Jimmy Fallon. And he has a, a, a professional of mindfulness, which is a form of meditation. It's a secular meditation. But he has, he has him on his show, and in the show, late, this is late night, like the world is seeing this, 
And I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him, I'm gonna let John play it so you see the whole thing. But he says, I want you to lead us through a meditation. Because, because we need it, because we see it. And I want you to see, I want you to go through it, I want you to see it, I want you to hear what he says, but also the response that comes after it. John, will you play this? So, so uh, the beauty of this and, and the presence of God in this, uh, because G- God's everywhere in this, right? Scripture says that every good gift is a gift from God. It comes from God. That all source of goodness flows out of God. Like there's not good things that happen that God's like, oh, where'd that come from? Like everything that's good in the world, inherently good, that makes life work, that's peace of God's goodness. And so this is a piece of, of the silence and solitude. This is a piece of the centering uh, the centering prayer. This is piece of that meditation, this welcoming. He says, don't block your thoughts. Whatever comes in, recognize it, and then let it go. Let it move on. And so, I mean, this is happening, and if, and if, if Jimmy Fallon says it, if you're sitting in the bar and you're watching this, can you imagine if that bar takes this posture <laughs> where everybody in the bar just goes silent? You're like, well, there was this one time in 2017 where we were watching at the bar, and then, like, everybody meditated together. You're like, what? What in the world? So, th- so this, this amazing, beautiful thing happens, and there's this reception to it. You hear it in the applause afterwards. And, and this is the invitation that we have of Christ, right? That, that, that our beings, our essence, it, it yearns for all of this. Scripture says that, that we're made so that our bodies yearn, hunger for all of eternity. We hunger for the fullness of God. And so when we, when we enjoy and participate in these practices, we're putting ourselves in a place and in a posture in life where God meets us there and our souls are stirred and they're calmed and they're fed and they're met by the divine. And the world is so hungry for this, but they've been met with another message from the church that's not full of beauty, that makes their heart adore them. So we have this opportunity as people who say we're walking with Christ to enter into these practices, to enter into this space so that this beauty leaks from us in our relationships and with the people that are around us. Here's another way to understand this. I spend time away from my family on this trip. And it's a lot like when, um, when Cammie and I were early dating in our relationship and, and we spent time away from each other. And, and back then you didn't have email and text message. You did, but it was, you didn't have text message, but you had email, but you had to get on, dial up, and you had to pay for that, and like it was limited. And so you wrote letters, right? You wrote letters and you'd put a stamp on it and you'd mail it and it would take three days to get there and you, and you couldn't wait till it showed up and you'd show up and you'd read it and you'd read it a hundred times. And you'd write things in these letters like, oh my, I miss your smile. I miss being with you. I miss your touch. I miss going out and, and sharing a meal and conversation and, and hearing about your day, good or bad, whatever's going on. And that's, that's meditation, right? When I'm, when I'm away from my family on these trips, I, I miss seeing my kids. I miss the conversation. I miss hearing about what was going on. I miss hearing about the interactions they've had with their friends, I miss hearing about what brought them joy in their day. I, hear, I miss hearing about what frustrated them through their day. And so I, my meditation is that, that I'm thinking about this relationship and the goodness and the value that it brings to me and the aspect that I have in their relationship. That is meditation. When we think about God, what are we yearning for? What are we so hungry for? What are we so overwhelmed with? in God's love and his interaction with us that we can't stop thinking about it, that we desire it, that we're hungry for it, that we need it throughout our day and in our moments. And next week I'll pair what contemplation, how that pairs with that. But that's what meditation looks like. The, the first and second century apostolic fathers, the, the next level of theologians and pastors who, who knew the disciples, they knew them in person, but they didn't know Jesus. So they were a little older. Um, they wrote in the Didache uh, this, this phrase, Maranatha. And some of us have heard this. And Maranatha is two, uh, two terms, two words uh, that mean Mar- Marin and Atha. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. And that is, that is the prayer of meditation. God, come. Jesus, 
be here, be present, be with us, be among us. The Navigators, uh, an, an evangel, evangelical group that ministers throughout the world, uh, they say there are, there are five aspects of med- meditation. And they, they use the hand to help navigate this. And so they say that the, the five aspects of meditation, your pinky is to hear the word, that we, we should be in a place where we're hearing the word of God. We're hearing stories of scripture. We're hearing uh, scripture read, uh, whether that's in a group or whether that's listening to an audio version at home, but that we're hearing scripture because when we hear it as opposed to reading it we engage with it differently so the pinky is to hear the word the ring finger is that we're reading the word that we have to make sure that we're reading scripture to come in contact with the word the middle finger is that we're teaching it that we're teaching ourselves that we're teaching our family members that we're teaching other people to help understand it and to engage with it the pointing finger is that we study it that we actually understand the context and the culture that was going on, that we, that we begin to understand aspects of the language and, the, and we utilize the tools that are out there so that we can engage with that. But they say that none of this matters without the fifth aspect, which is the thumb. And the thumb is the meditation. That we think about these things to help them become ingrained. And the thumb interacts with all other four areas so that when we read Scripture or when we hear Scripture, we meditate on the hearing of the Scripture. And then when we, when we read Scripture, we're meditating on it. And when we teach Scripture, we're meditating on it. And when we're studying Scripture, we're meditating. And they say it's, it's like grasping something, that if I grasp it without my thumb, this can easily get knocked from my hand. I don't have a firm grip grasp on this. But the thumb allows me to grasp it, to hold on to it, to make it, to possess it, to own this. And so that we must act, we we must energize and exercise all five areas of meditation in the word so that we can engage and grasp firmly that which God has for us. The thumb connects to give us a grasp. And without it, if we just use a thumb, then we're just hitchhiking with no direction, with no wisdom, with no discipline. So meditation are these love letters, these love thoughts that we think of how good God has been to us and how he's interacting with us. I want to close with a practice of meditation. Uh, It's a guided meditation, and it's one that's fit for a group. And so I want to invite you to set aside whatever distractions you may have. If you've uh, had your phone out, scripture or or checking your messages, put that aside. Uh, If you were doodling or drawing, put that down, put that aside. If you were poking the person next to you, stop doing that. Find a comfortable seating position and, and try to relax. Try to let your shoulders relax, your hands relax, leave your hands on your on your thighs or even as he said, feel free to put one on your stomach so that you can feel and focus on your breathing. Begin to focus on your breaths. Inhale, hold it, and then exhale. Now imagine yourself walking down a road. This is your path of life. And I want you to imagine what this path looks like. Is it straight? Are there curves on your path? Is it flat? Is it hilly? Is it gravel or matted down grass? Or is it paved? Is it a sidewalk? What's it look like? Is your path wide or is it narrow? Is it surrounded by trees or is it in a field or is it through a city? Look down at your path. Look down at your feet. Look to the left and to the right of where you are. Look at the sky. 
Maybe it's sandy. Maybe you're on a beach. Think about what it feels like, what it smells like. What's up ahead of you on your path? Can you see as it disappears into the horizon? Is it clear? Are there hurdles in your way? As you walk down your path, there's something that's in your hands. You've been carrying it a long time. It's something that you brought with you. It's in your spirit. It's a part of you. I want you to look at your hand and see what it is. What's this thing that you've been carrying? What does it look like? What does it feel like in your hands? Is it heavy? Is it hot or cold? Is it smooth or prickly or sharp or rough? Now look ahead on your path. You see coming towards you a figure. You can't make it out at this point of who it is. But he seems to know you and his pace quickens as he recognizes you. And now you can see him. You recognize that it's Jesus and he's coming closer to you. He's walking faster to get to you. And as he gets closer, features on who he is become more apparent. And you're able to look at the expression on his face. What is the expression? How is Christ looking at you? And how do you feel as you look at him? And as he gets close to you, he says a word of greeting to you. What is it that he says? And how does he interact with you? What do you say back? And now Jesus is standing in front of you. What is he saying? And how is he looking at you? And he reaches out his hand and he wants you to put what's in your hands in his hands. How does it feel with the object as it leaves your your hand and you give it to him? Are you ashamed? Are you nervous? Are you relieved? Are you thankful? What does Jesus say or how does he look at you as he takes it from you? And now you and Jesus start to walk together. And he's holding the object that you gave him. And two of you walk along, think about what you talk about. And imagine the conversation. This is meditation. That we picture and we think and we imagine that God is walking with us. That he's very real because he is very real and he is very much alive. And he is present as much as he is in this room as he was 2,000 years ago when he walked with his disciples. And when we invite that presence of God in our lives and we walk with him through the trials and the struggles and the joys and the celebrations that are life, we see that God has a posture of goodness and beauty and blessing. And anything that is against that is a false narrative of God. It's a way that we've seen God that's not true. And so our meditation allows us to see God as he truly is and Christ as he truly is which is uh, as good, good father, benevolent father, kind and generous father. And that we walk through life, wherever that may be, walking alongside of him, 
so that we can become overwhelmed with the goodness of his love. Let's pray. God, thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for sending your son who was Emmanuel, who was God in the flesh so that he could move into the neighborhood, so that we could see what it looks like to live with God in this world through the life of Christ. And in that life, we see that it is free of condemnation, that it is free of judgment, and yet it calls us to a way of life that is more than what we often settle for. So God, help us step into the mysteries and to the marvel, the things that are magnificent, so that we may see the freedom that comes in walking in the goodness and the beauty that is with Christ. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So let me give you a blessing. And may your hearts and your life and your passions grow hungry for God like giant sushi served at a hibachi grill or like catching up with a college friend and connecting with life. Or may you yearn for the love of God like being on a business trip and away from your family and the comforts of your home. And may you be overwhelmed with the love and the mercy and the goodness that God, as you think and reflect and meditate and dance in his goodness. May God be with you. Go in God's peace.